Yeah. When Harriet, when did you first become aware of Harold? What was your first encounter with him as a as a writer? Um, at drama school. Um, given that drama schools tend to um, have a sort of one of everything on the shelf when when you arrive at drama school. You, um, I was probably chosen, perhaps, to be the Pinter actress. <laughs> um, I didn't quite take on what that meant, except that um, I had been told that I was very subtle. <laughs> um, not always as a compliment, um, that I could convey what was going on in my head very quite interestingly and clearly, but that I really needed to work on my projection and my voice and all those sorts of things. So I think they gave me Pinter because they thought I could do that internal, um, you know, having a secret, having a mystery. And um, we did do a wonderful exercise when we were rehearsing. We, it was the lover we were doing. Um, and then I had to do another extract from... Uh, I think it might have been old times, um, just an extract at our sort of final performance as we left, you know, to present to agents. So again, I think they thought that was my strong suit. <laughs> so that's how I became aware of Harold, really. A woman with a mis um, mysterious past. Well, we had a wonderful exercise while we were doing The Lover because I I, I do remember being very absorbed inside that play. Um, I remember, I remember, unlike any other thing I did at the time, having an inner life about that play. Um, and because I was not at all sophisticated, least of all with sexual games, and I didn't really know what the hell it was about, but I did have um, a sense of... of you know, some kind of labyrinth inside me that was where I had to work. Mm. And um, and then a sort of lightness of touch on the top that um, actually, um, obviously that was, that must have, I don't remember, but I remember uh, the, 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 um, the rehearsals, but, but I do remember remember the person who was directing me doing sort of concurrently um, um, the whole class had to do an exercise one afternoon where we had to give a lecture it was an improv class and we had to give a lecture um, but we, we each had something going on that was private that was nothing to do with the lecture so you know and he'd give us you know he said to me um, you've got a migraine and but I also had to give this lecture in you know about the vikings or something so um and it was it was a very interesting exercise i don't remember if it happened exactly the same time as i was doing the pinter but i realized that that you know i i i could put those two things together and realized that the characters in 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 pinter could be having a migraine but talking about the weather it, was there anything in your earlier development as a as a person that I mean do you feel any sense of 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 an affinity with with the way Harold writes certain women is there a knack is it natural for you to step into their shoes no I I mean if we if we're being very very honest I've I've always had a sort of um disjoint between me and the sort of rather elegant mysterious women he that I've portrayed, of, you know, I've only played Anna in old times outside of um, drama school. And then I've done a Pinter script for Turtle Diary, a film called Turtle Diary, which was a Russell Hoban novel, which um, Harold did the screenplay for and played a small part in. We were both in the same scene. And um, um, I felt, um, which is, you know, not particular to Harold, but um, the the roles for women in that era that are just ahead of me, a little bit older than me, um, were still, they felt like um, 
it felt like you were having to fulfill a man's ideal of a woman rather than actually inhabit the character with your own with your own life so there wasn't much i could use of absolutely me in his women although because um that isn't all they're about um you know for instance in old times there's so much that's about memory and about friendship and about um um yes i would say those two things uh, principally that 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 held me together like glue that i could relate to uh, and london being in my past you know the streets of london the albert hall the rain all those things were very much my youth and you know you're very influenced when you're in your you, when you're growing up by the people who are just a bit older than you so you know i was influenced by the sort of swinging 60s and the beautiful women in um uh, you know jean shrimpton or whatever so i was sort of thinking of those sorts of women being the objects of the characters in pinter's plays eyes and also of his eyes i was thinking of leggy beautiful sort of iconic women and how i couldn't match up to that and then i started to again the interior life is what saves you because you may be objectified not by pinter but by the characters in the play i'm taking for instance the homecoming you know all the men put so much they project so much onto this woman who and on anna in in um, not anna kate in old times they are objects that people project things onto but pinter tells you that's what's happening he's aware that that's what's happening and because it's theater there is an actress who has to occupy that body mm. who can be thinking what the hell they like just as in life we are thinking what the hell we like and other people are supposing guessing trying to read what's going on but all kind of um interfered with by their own desires by their own personal hatreds likes dislikes they're projecting things onto you and as the word that lindy davis our director on old times used to use colonizing your memory colonizing your interior life by saying you're thinking this and um and but but pinter makes that what the play is about so you can you can't blame him. You can't say, oh, he objectifies women, because that is exactly what he's telling you the characters on stage are doing. And you as an actor have free reign to occupy that space and know that they're wrong. That's or it, whatever. It's it's fascinating. I mean, I, you know, I have in recent times had one or two lively arguments with um, some younger people some of them women, um, about, for example, Ruth in The Homecoming and the fact that um, if she can only secure her freedom in a man's world by deploying her erotic and sexual powers um, and, you know, hoodwink them to a, to a T, then, um, it, you know, Harold Pinter is, is still guilty of um, misogyny of disempowering women or only seeing it through a patriarchal mm. lens. And what you've just said about uh, all the characters being free to have whatever thoughts they want and whatever strategies they want, it seems to me um, that to some extent that's, that is missing the point. And that, that, you know, it is arguable that Harold in his way is a feminist. You mean who's missing the point, me or them? No, them. Sorry. Then. Yes. I mean, that's me and my survival technique as an actress, but I also think it has to be true that Harold meant that to happen. Because when he looks at, you know, Harold was a, was a man living at a time when I, I can't, I mean, the word misogyny is thrown about quite a lot. It means, I think it means you don't like women, which is not, or you hate women, which is not exactly what Harold can be held guilty of. Um, he was a man of his time, just like Shakespeare, who wrote great plays and with brilliant insight into humanity and a great poet. Um, 
he was a man of his time. And we say, oh, why didn't Shakespeare write for women? Or why didn't, you know, Harold Pinter was a man of his time. He didn't, he didn't leap out of it and, and think differently. He was a living man who had very strong um, heterosexual feelings. And um, that's the world he saw. And I don't expect him not to to work that way, but I go, well, how come he still lasts? How come I still want to do his plays? How come I want to be in this play? How come it does ring true? Um, and we're used to, as women, we're used to setting aside and going, oh, gulp, I'll have to get over that little hump. <laughs> well, it's not a little hump, but I have to get over that hump and, and find a way to express something of, who I am and, I, and it seems to me that whether Harold intended it or not, by making it a play that we act rather than a book that we read, um, you, you can answer back as an actor. Right, yeah. And find a, a real independent life for, for, for a character yes. rather, rather than them, them being a mouthpiece for, for the author or anybody else. I think it's easier to play Anna because she sort of comes and goes and we don't know if she's really come and we don't know if she's really gone and we don't know where she really is. But, and I think, you know, if I'd ever been asked to play Ruth, it would be a much more difficult task really because your young friends are right. That does seem to be her only way of, and, and, and but it's a brilliant illustration of how women had to carry on in those days. You had to play a man's game. Mm. That you know, um, but maybe it's just the easiest, and maybe it's just the most economic way she can she can get what she wants. Because who'd look who is uh, as bright and on the case as Ruth is? Who would look a gift horse in the mouth? These men are there for the taking. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not like it may not be her only strategy. It's yeah, just it's just the obvious one. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I don't think he's any guiltier than any, you know, than Simon Gray or, or um, you know, John Osborne or I mean Arnold West. Well, maybe not Arnold West, but all those people who were writing at that time. The ethos that I was coming out of drama school into was, you know, it was absolutely the moment when feminism was breaking through, and um, Jermaine Greer had just written *The Female Eunuch*, and we were just forming female theatre groups and. It was absolutely in its infancy, and um, but it, it would it would you know just like we have to tackle Shakespeare's lack of you know that half of his brain. Um, it, it's so worthwhile to you know for the for the super the super picture the the humanity basic basically in and the brilliance of his poetry really I think the, the word poetry comes in because poetry is um it, it 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 demands your imagination is in there as well it's not it's not um it's asking you to bring your imagination into how you speak and therefore there's a lot of work you know it's very rich is what I'm saying and but I really don't think you could swap the gender in a penta play in the way that you can in a Shakespeare play. Well, that's a fascinating <laughs> question. You, you're very well placed to speak to that. But um, why shouldn't there be a? Um, why wouldn't you play uh, Davies? I mean, uh, in the oh character. yes, that sort of thing. Yes, but some of the sort of when yes, absolutely. The, it's it's easier for the females. For, for women to play, I mean, it's it's a big question as to whether women are playing them as men or changing the gender of the character. Mm. I think the latter is much more complicated because you can't, you know, you wouldn't have a Ruth who was a Robin, um, and you know, it just because the the situation being described is in, is 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 one that is totally embedded in the sexism of the time it's in and you can't change that there are more sort of huge universal political um plays written by Shakespeare than there are by Harold but certainly you could play I don't know something horrible like you know you could play a female torturer just about or a female victim of torture or Absolutely. you know I think there are cases where you could swap things around I think uh, I want to see one for the road played that that character, that terrifying 
head of the security services uh, would be absolutely extraordinary if, if you had yeah. the right the right it would be very you, challenging because we like to think we wouldn't be like that as I've women. seen but... I've seen the dumb way to play played by two women and so on I, I I wouldn't have any any problem with it at all I've been running all through lockdown I've been running a a, a zoom gathering every Friday of, of people who love Harold's work and we never we, we've never one once thought that that um there's any reason why the casting can't be constantly shifted around and it just constantly reveals different facets of the, of the, of so the long document. as you're really examining why and what's coming out of it I agree I just think that precisely for the reasons I've outlined in the plays that I've talked about it would be hard because what you're actually talking about is the interior life of a woman as that as it is experienced and has been experienced by a woman for all their life being brought to bear in a situation where yes a man could be placed in that position and could feel what it's like to be a woman which is what we do as actors but they couldn't bring the reality of their womanhood to it which is another sort of very essential thing in those particular plays I think but I'm happy to be proved wrong. Do you, do you remember seeing The Homecoming? Do you remember seeing Ruth for the first time? I think I saw Lindsay Duncan for the first time because although it was a much talked about play, I'd never seen the original, you know, I'd never seen the early days. The one I knew best was The Caretaker probably because I don't know, I just seen it more. I don't know, it's fairly random what you've seen. The extraordinary thing about, as, as we've been doing on these, these Friday sessions, looking at, at, at some of the plays, is although a play like The Lover, which is the, where we came in, um, obviously has elements that are dated and that are very period connected. Nevertheless, the energy between the masculine and feminine in, in the play, between the, the, in the within the marriage, are, are, are completely universal and eternal and archetypal. Very, very, regular, yeah. And, and um, lose none of its, none of their charge. In fact, anyone who's ever been involved in anything like a marriage or, or a long-term relationship is going to completely recognise Yes, all elements. that exchange of, of, of narrative, that exchange, do you remember when we, that, you know, and the sort of, no, it wasn't then, it was then, those kind of disjointed memories that that show that even with the person you've lived with most of your life, there are huge areas of, I don't know you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you do that, then I will do this. Yes. <laughs> and if I do this, what will you do? And we're fitting one's, ourselves round one another because to, to be somewhere else is not conceivable. We are. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. I mean, I do, uh, I do feel spending more and more time thinking about Harold's work. I do feel that the, uh, I use the word lightly, but the word that, that I do feel that the archetype of marriage, of a, of a combination a complementarity between the sexes and between energies within one person, because uh, you know, if we read and believe anything that Jung said, he 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 proposes that there is a, a feminine component within a, a man and a, a masculine within a woman, and all that, and that somehow that, as an archetypal kind of um, energetic chunk, is, is of enormous instinctive interest to Harold he, he it's puts very interesting in. you say that because I, I can't imagine him not connected with a woman you know he's always in in any of our knowledge although he's obviously written alone and done things alone he's always been in a yin yang envelope yes. hasn't he yes uh, uh, including with with his mother whom who, who must have been a tremendous influence on him. I never met her, but uh, I love what um, his girlfriend, uh, Jennifer Mortimer said, that it, it's quoted in Michael Billington's book, but she just said, I think Harold must have been the, had the most wonderful parents, but they, they must have loved him so much because he never had any doubt as to his own, the, the, the validity of his own voice, of his own presence. And I'm, I'm, I, I find that, uh, you know, a very, a very <laughs> touching idea that um, he had a very yeah. positive experience of mothering. Yeah, 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 lovely. But we can't really, uh, we can't unfortunately turn to Frances and ask her to <laughs> to comment. Um, so we're stuck with uh, with talking about him. But um, when you came to do old times, I mean, I'm not going to discount your two radio 
uh, plays, um, Ashes to Ashes and um, a kind mm -hmm. of Alaska, because I think even, even with as little rehearsal as we had for Ashes to Ashes, but nevertheless, because you're, because you're you and you knew Harold and you chose those plays, you wanted to do those plays, I do think that um, that, that experience is is very valid and radio as you know is a very interesting way of getting very deep very quickly way of expressing yes um i mean one of one of the questions you asked me was something like you know um what were you most frightened of or so in, in in with harold can, can you remember the question where you asked me something like when you came to work with him what were you most nervous of or well it's a it's a good Good question. Do you remember? No, it was something like, um, "What? Oh, here you are. What excited you and daunted you about oh, work?" Okay. Yeah. So, so I think it, it all, all comes. In, I think that somehow in my head, those radio plays because they happened after he died. <laughs> that was awful. But I, I felt I was in a different place than when I was actually working in his lifetime on his work. Do you see what I mean? Just because it wasn't that I felt less responsibility now he'd gone. It was perhaps one felt more. But um, definitely when I did the first run through of Old Times, which I came to late, I, I was slotted in with just over, just under 10 days to get it on in the West End. I was taking oh. over from somebody else. And the way we were working was very, very profound in order to, you know, the director worked vertically rather than horizontally so that in 10 days I was ready. I knew the lines, I knew the moves, I knew what I was thinking. But I had not added the layer, the layer at the top, the glitter, the glitz, the charm, the, the ease, the, the stuff that goes on top of our behavior, the stuff that we, I don't know. Harold came and he was, uh, and I was obviously quite nervous of him coming. I knew him by then, you know, we'd met several times and, you know, knew one another, but I'd not worked on his work in front of him before. And I was nervous. And um, indeed he gave notes at the end and said, I don't, I don't see the fulfillment of this character. You know, I don't know why she's so um, not lugubrious, but introspective or something, you know, that was to do with my process that I was still, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't like, are you going to do it like that? I mean, I hadn't got to the, I hadn't got there yet. I was, um, I was like doing it without makeup, if you know what I mean. And yeah. Anna has makeup. And, um, but I wouldn't have really realized that because all I knew was that I was tracing this very complicated truth inside my head and reacting with the other actors and creating this network, you know, in here. Mm. And he was only seeing that and saying, but I don't, but the, but she's a character. She's a, she's a, she's a sort of, she's an attractive, um, vibrant sort of exciting woman you know and I and and there I get again I came against oh my god I'm not an attractive vibrant sexual exciting Pinteresque woman do you know I'm not that ideal Pinter woman um and then but but it was galvanic because I thought god I've got to do that I see that's that's how the play's going to work you know and in the last 48 hours I got there. It wasn't like a terrible sort of radical note that said you've got it all wrong. It wasn't that I had to restructure the inside of my head. It was just that I had to put this extra layer on to sell it. Mm. Um, well, and sure. that was relatively easy, actually, because once you, you know, in other words, the comedy, the the lightness of touch, the, the pizzazz, and that with the same sometimes dark thoughts was very it was exactly what you know threw me back to to the original experience at drama school where you had to get it all where you had the migraine I was just showing in the migraine and, and not not right. doing the Viking lecture <laughs> but um it was galvanic because I don't think the director said the director said oh, I was going to get to that stage I wish he hadn't sort of come in at that point and said that but actually 
because it was Harold Pinter and because it was quite a frightening note, I went, ah, oh, and then I realized that's exactly what I have to do. That's exactly right. And I can do it and it's going to be fine. Well, that was um, a, one of his great things as a director was he knew he knew acting very well and he he knew the power I, I would have I would propose that he knew the power of of permission of really giving an actor permission to yes. um go further do more take a bigger risk that's a great way of putting it permission yeah because that's well, what he we is the writer after all that's extra good but the other thing that um because then i went on to work with him as a director when he directed me in simon gray's play the late middle classes and we were rehearsing in watford and we both lived in northwest london in, in west london so we both took the train from um, from Earl's Court um, every morning together and sort of sitting across a table from him for a 40 minute journey. When you say what was daunting, that was daunting because as we all know, Harold famously didn't do small talk. Mm. And what I love, what I find so ironic is that his characters do do small talk but it's it it's small talk with a twist you know it's small talk with a kind of uh, you know making a, a chorus of a word like nevertheless or you know um but 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 sort of throwing back our our ordinary speak and making it unordinary because the situation is unordinary oh, okay thank you um <laughs> Um, so, so I find it, he's obviously always heard this sort of superficial small talk that oils the wheels for me. I mean, I couldn't live without small talk. Um, but, um, that is quite repressive to be told somebody doesn't, you know, just doesn't do it. Um, because you go, have I got to go straight into Proust, you know, <laughs> which we often did on our journeys. We went straight into Proust and, um. It was great. I loved those journeys in the end. I've got Simon Gray sitting on my ear here on my wall. Um, oh, uh, yes, so you have. And Harold yeah. next to him playing cricket. So I, I think of them very much as a sort of um, a double act. Yes. It must have, it must have felt marvellous to have been invited to create that role. And It was uh, absolutely, and and particularly because it wasn't, dare I say it, it wasn't terribly difficult because whereas, as I say, the Pinter roles, I felt, oh, I don't, I, you know, I'm not this type of woman. I'm not the, the leggy, elegant, you know, um, men twisting around her finger kind of woman. That's, I don't really identify with that. And I have to kind of get to them via a different route. I did totally seem to understand Simon Gray's mother figure in in you know it was it was recognizably uh you know elements of my mother for instance um and then with simon's wit and humor um she became very individual but it was all very unlike the harold experience it was there sort of in the writing, the right, the rhythm of the writing told you who she was in a real world. Whereas Pinter's writing is more mysterious and more, um, you know, elliptical, and you have to kind of unlock it. Um, which is, I'm not comparing that. You know, they're both. You know, you could sit in the middle of both writers and and inhabit them, but it was harder work getting to a Pinter woman than because they're not so. They're more mysterious. We don't quite know who they are. That there's an element always of um, is she real? Is she really in the room? What's happening? You know. Yeah, whereas the dreamlike quality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the poetic. I mean, Simon yeah. Gray's work is 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 extraordinarily brilliant. Not least because he makes it look so easy. But but Harold's work is distinct from almost everybody because every every word he writes is in some sense part of a poem. And you know that it's written by Harold Pinter. <laughs> You know, you can't, it's like knowing a chord by Chopin. You know, you've only got to play a chord of Chopin. I know it's Chopin. Um, how, was, how, did that, how did it come about, the uh, the casting of Late Middle Classes? Do you remember? No, no, it just came instantly. I think I had, I'd done a part um, on a TV film by, by Simon called They Never Slept. 
and it was comic and it was very period and maybe maybe they knew that I could do that thing I could I could sort of do period and and be funny yeah um although it wasn't supposed to be ha ha funny but it it you know there were elements were definitely you ha- you had to be funny and my worst thing about that was that I had to come on having hit a tennis ball onto the stage and then come charging on and that you know I never really got past that you know where Harold was continually giving me a tennis lesson and <laughs> Forget the acting. It was get that tennis right. <laughs> he didn't like the way you were holding the racket or something. I, I, you know, at some point I just didn't look like it was real, you know, and I didn't look like I knew how I was doing it. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was a very. <laughs> it was funny that that was the thing that was the sticky point, and it was the first thing I did in the play. But their friendship was very beautiful, um, and. M- m- almost because they were so different politically and in so many ways. And I actually, this is to you, Harry, rather than the world. Um, I was here in Dorset and I got the call. I was supposed to be going to have lunch with Harold and Antonia that day. And I got a call from Antonia saying Simon had died. But but it said, please come anyway, Harold. You know, we, we must cheer Harold up. Well, that was one of the stickiest lunches I've ever been in, as you can imagine. But um, it was anyway. a tremendous, uh, tremendous love and bond between, yeah, yeah. between the two of them. And Harold directed nine or ten or more of Harold of Simon's plays. And he had this awful world. thing where it didn't go into the West End. It was very betrayed, that show, because it was sort of 99% chance and there were two theatre or one theatre that was ready for us and we were oh, going for yeah. a West End transfer and after a tour, we'd had very good reviews apart from the Sunday Times. Yes. And somebody pulled their money out because they thought that some probably American money pulled out because they thought the Sunday Times could make or break a a show which in our country doesn't happen and plus I don't know some extraordinary machine machinations went on behind our back that was part of it another part of it was there was a boy band coming into town and they wanted a theatre and that was devastating to both Harold and Simon absolutely devastating they were so enraged now I as an actor had been several times not been allowed to go into the West End. And I thought, come on, get over it, you know, and a bit, this is the way of the world. But being the, being them, it was uh, incomprehensible, a terrible slight. Um, mm. I'm not sure that play was right for the West End. I think it was quite a delicate play. And, Very intimate, certainly. And, and I, I wasn't as heartbroken, I wasn't heartbroken for me, but I was heartbroken for them because they took it so badly. On the other hand, Harold directed the original production of Quartermain's Terms, which is, again, a tremendously intimate, delicate, very painful to watch play about true relationships. And that played in, in an 800 theater, seat theatre for, for yeah, that's nine months. So I think if anybody could make that that work in a big theatre, Harold could. Harold, with, your, with the company that, that you had. I mean, it was a wonderful cast, wasn't it? I, d- I did that on the radio, actually. You've reminded me. Um, and it was on the telly, wasn't it? Quartermain's terms. Uh, yeah, I mean, it might be the, the style of acting now. You always have to fight this thing that people are so used to televised, televisual acting and, um, you know, acting that looks like acting that can project into 800 people is is harder now than it was a couple of decades ago. Certainly, but still, technically, okay. It's okay. technically becoming more and more challenging for, for young people to to know how to... Make yes, it. I mean, they can be mic'd up, but that's not the point. <clears throat> um, we didn't get mic'd up, but but in that act of having to project, you learnt that you could find a truth in it. Mm. It was a very difficult journey for me personally. As I said, at drama school, I was told that projection was the thing I had to really work on. And we, I suppose it is of most young actors. I spoke to uh, I, I spoke to Indira Varma a couple of days ago, and she, she told a tiny story about working with Harold where she completely lost her confidence and wasn't sure in the character, wasn't at all sure why the character was behaving in a certain way. And Harold said to her, but if you're truthful, you can do anything. And I think that's what allows actors to find scale and scope and range and 
um, dynamics on stage in a big theatre, even when even when we're playing, um, you know, something very intimate. That's that's the um, this bit. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah, do it yeah. on screen. The counterintuitive. Tapping her tummy and uh, tapping her head. Yes, it that and and there is a, an excitement and a joy to that when you do crack it. Mm, absolutely, and we're all missing at the moment because we can't. That's we right. can't um, stand up and shout at the moment. Do you think I probably do have to go pretty soon? But but let me know if there's something we haven't covered. I, I think I've got two things more I'd love to ask. One is, do you feel in your own development as an actor? Do you feel there are any debts to Harold uh, technically that that you learnt things from from from? I mean, we've just discussed one maybe about the tummy and the head uh, having these plates spinning at once. But is there anything that you particularly relish about playing Harold? Um, I think that just, you know, and perhaps it's something I I do with Shakespeare as well, is um, the way that no word is not there for a reason. You know, every single word is like, so in a way it's like you have to bite every word and but make it sound organic and natural. Um, and I think sort of watching him acting his own work um, and getting furious about people getting over worked up about pauses and, you know, dot, dot, dots and punctuation. You know, when we were doing Turtle Diary, there was a script at, a script supervisor who kept coming up to him saying, uh, you know, coming up to us saying there's a dot, dot, dot there. Or, and then actually when Pinter came in and did his scene, he breezed through it, and didn't, you know, didn't do any of the dot, dot, dots. Um, I mean, that was a film script, so it wasn't so arch anyway. It was more, um, you know, but, but and, and in that film, Ben Kingsley played the lead and he, I suppose what, what you're asking me about what I've learned, I've learned more from watching other actors doing Pinter well, and I don't know whether I've achieved it, but but it, it is to do with the, the the rhythm of the words, observing the, the the rhythm of the words and biting them all. And, you know, it's like sort of polishing them, that nothing's muddy or gooey. It's all sharp and polished. And um, I think I took that into other jobs I did afterwards, just this idea of of um, selecting a word, looking at it under the light and, you know, popping it out there. Um, but also with some kind of ease that means that 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 it it does sound as though it's coming from a human being. And uh, the, the perfect exemplar of that, I thought in, in Turtle Diary, this film was Ben Kingsley. He had this sort of exactness that Pinter requires uh, and landed these phrases, but it was done with such a twinkle in the eye and such a sort of intelligence um, that that felt like when Harold's doing his own work, you know, there's just that, that sort of little twinkle above it that that sort of challenges the audience so much as to how they're supposed to take it. Mm. Mm. And just finally, um, the range of Harold's female characters just, just astonishes me continually. And <clears throat> with a kind of Alaska uh, where he imagines what it what it might be like to awaken from from decades of unconsciousness um, and ashes to ashes where he imagines a, a woman finding herself in a kind of underground river of grief and universal pain how how can actors mere <laughs> mere actors find in themselves i mean this is a huge question i'm not asking you to to, to but i'm just a very uh, interesting one how, how do how do actors trust their impulse and um and receive what harold's offering or what any great writer but particularly i think poet playwrights shakespeare obviously as well um th these are amazing acts of imagination on his part the actor i i just think the actor has played paid an enormous compliment by harold but nevertheless it can be very daunting would, would you would you think would you say 
Well, I think I think we've we talked about this when we were doing those two plays a bit. Um, and I do come back to Shakespeare again. You know, Shakespeare will give you a monologue after your husband's head has been chopped off and you're lying next to his corpse. I mean, I'm thinking of Cymbeline and it, and it isn't, in the end, we find out it isn't his corpse, it's somebody else's. But nevertheless, you think that, and he gives you the speech of someone whose husband, has just, you know, who thinks that their husband's head has been cut off. You have never experienced it and you hope you never will. He's never experienced it. You go, how does he know what that person would say? This is to question, you know, what is genius? How does genius do anything? I mean, I don't know how they do it, but the first words that that character says is, I hope I dream, right? I hope I dream. Forward. Uh, you know, and that's just, how does he do that? I don't know. Well, Harold does similar things that I just know that I trust the poet, the poet's imagination. He's not literally saying, what does someone who's just woken up from, you know, a 40 year coma say? He's, he's using it as an existential kind of parable. And so I can go with the flow of the poetry rather than cross-examine, you know, clinically what somebody would or wouldn't say. And I found the key to that was in the different ages that this character thinks they're at and to just inhabit my memories of when I was that age and, and my expectations and the headspace that I would have been in at that time. And it is a fascination because, you know, it's like, it's like speaking and, and ashes to ashes, it's like speaking your dreams aloud. It's as though you were in a dream and you were talking about the dream while you were having the dream. And I don't know how he gets there. We never will know how he gets there. Um, if he was here, he probably wouldn't be able to tell you how he gets there. But a voice comes into his head and it suddenly builds and and you, the actor, we, we, we in a way you don't, need to be as profound as he is as long as you as long as your ability can sell it and put it out there for the audience to receive it uh i prefer to be in the steering wheel and think i know what i'm doing something but but st still i could just speak those words and something would happen to an audience list and that's the first line of alaska something is happening um cool. But but I hear what you're really what a lot of uh, of what you've just said uh, essentially is is an invitation to actors to trust themselves on the inside and that they, if they're brave and go within they will find a connection and to follow that thread really. That's that's the exciting bit. Yeah. That's what makes it all exciting. If you know if you read a play and you go oh I know how I say that. Go home. Trust trust trust. Yeah. Harriet. Most grateful to you for, for being part of this and uh, send you many, many thanks. And you too. Best see wishes. You Thank you so I much. hope we can see you outdoors in W12. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.